Uh, good evening, everyone, and we're going to get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us for another uh, installment of our pairs meetings via via webinar. Um, I'm very excited this evening to be able to introduce Dr. Ari Isaacson. Um, uh, one of his specific areas of focus is prostate artery embolization, and he uh, was one of the key speakers at this year's uh, SIR meeting. So we're very welcome to have him. Um, just as a reminder to everybody, if you have a question that comes up during the meeting, just type it in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll go over that at the end. Um, so uh, again, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Isaacson. So thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the invite. Uh, to speak to you guys, um, you get my slides going here. So, um, you know, when my ex-colleague, ex-colleague Kevin Anton, who works at Jefferson now, used to work with me at UNC, asked me if I'd give a talk to the Philly Angio Club, I got very excited because uh, I used to spend some time in Philly uh, back when I was in college. I used to go to Spring Fling every uh, every year with my friend at Penn. And I have some very fond memories of Philly. And so I thought I would, I would put together a custom talk just for the Philly Angio Club. And I know that some people out there know that I occasionally put together a rap. And you know, I wasn't gonna do that for this because, well, I thought maybe I just maybe do a little something just just for you guys, but they're not like a freestyle or anything like that. You know, just one of these. Yo, Philadelphia Angio Club, thank you for the invite and showing me love. Today we're talking all about PAEs. We're gonna make it as simple as with with please. In the first step, you gotta find that PA. Now I'm talking about the prostate, not the keystone state. Step two, you get your catheter in. Could be tough like Balboa. Yo, Adrian. Step three. Keep your embo clean, all the beads in the prostate, that's what I mean. Now all you gotta do is get a hoagie and wait. You'll have flow like the school in about 60 days. Yo, Philly Angio Club, you guys ready to talk about this, John? Let's do this. All right, so there you go. I got you a little little something, some some Philly, Philly references in there. Um, I, I made this CME friendly. I didn't know what we were gonna do here, so I had some disclosures and objectives, but We'll kind of skip through that. What I really want to talk about today uh, is uh, how we got to where we are with PAE. We've been doing this now, oh, I think seven years or so. And so we've, we've come a long way um, with our research and our program building and all that. So I want to talk about how we got to where we are, but then I also want to talk about where we're going uh, in the future, where PAE is going. But before we do any of that, I think we need to hear a short message from one of our founding fathers. Hello, my fellow Philadelphians. It is a little known fact that I had the first PAE in 1772. See, I bet you didn't know that, that Ben Franklin was really the first PAE uh, way back then. So we're a little bit late in the game, but the reemergence of PAE started in about 2000 when there was a case report uh, in, the, in JVIR uh, in which a patient who had come in for hematuria, secondary to BPH, was treated with selective embolization of the prostate for the hematuria. And when he returned for follow-up, not only was his hematuria better, but now he reported improved urination as well. And so that uh, case report came out and, and it started to, to cause people to think, could this really be a, good, a real treatment for BPH that we could eventually develop and start using clinically? Well, over the course of the 2000s, as with any new procedure, animal studies were done. And one of these studies was, uh, which was published in radiology was a randomized study in which they took two different sets of male pigs. Uh, one had PAE done and, the, and one set did and the other set did and was the control group. And they wanted to assess these pigs sexual function. Uh, and what they found was that the pigs who had PAE performed just as well sexually as the pigs that did not have PAE. And whenever I read about this study or I talk about it, I think about some poor medical student or lab assistant that had to stand there with a the clipboard and assess the sexual function of these pigs as they were doing their business. I gave this talk one, I showed this slide at one meeting one time and one of my radiology colleagues from North Carolina came up to me afterwards and said, I have the perfect picture uh, for, to follow this slide. And this is what he gave me and I have to agree I think it's the perfect picture to follow that slide. 
moving on. Um, what, what data do we have uh, between the time that we started doing human studies until now? I'm just gonna give you a quick summary of all the ty types of studies we have. And then after that, I'll summarize what they say. So believe it or not, there've been six randomized controlled trials that have compared PAE to TERP, the, the gold standard for BPH uh, procedures. There has been a study that has compared PAE to a sham procedure. There have been multiple meta-analyses that have combined the previous RCTs and also systematic reviews that have pooled data from numerous uh, single arm studies. There was a big registry in the UK um, that took data from about 17 different centers and combined it in, into this registry. And the, the result of that registry was that PAE uh, became uh, a, an option as a standard of care option as part of the national healthcare system in the UK. And then finally, at this point, there have been about 30 to 40 single arm studies from all over the world. All over the world, this has been done. So what are these studies say? Well, before I give you the summary, in, in order to understand the summary, you have to know what they're all assessing. And this is the key right here. This is the main questionnaire that is used to assess men with BPH. And it, it um, assesses lower urinary tract sy symptoms or LUTs, we might say. Uh, there are seven different categories. The most severe you can get is a five. So the worst you could be is a 35. The best you could be is a zero. And then at the bottom, there's a quality of life question that says, if you were to have these symptoms for the rest of your life, how would you feel about that? And so zero is the best you could be and six is the worst. So keep that in mind as I talk about the results of, of these trials. So when you look at all of those randomized controlled trials that compare PAE to TERP, um, what they show is that TERP uh, improves the objective metrics better than PA. And what are the objective metrics? Those are things like how quickly the urine comes out when you urinate into a, a, a bucket or uh, how much uh, urine is left after you urinate post void residual. But in the subjective reporting, that is that IPSS questionnaire I just showed you, the PAE is pretty similar to TERP in a lot of those studies and even superior in one of the studies. When you start with people who have severe lower urinary tract symptoms, that is 19 and above on that IPSS scale, it's pretty consistent that PAE reduces that score by about 10 to 15 points. And, that's, and that is, it's, that's actually pretty good. It's comparable to some of the newer urology procedures that you may have heard of, like Urolift or Resume. We know from that randomized trial of PAE versus a sham procedure that the, the effect of PAE is much more than placebo. Uh, it's, so it's not a sham. It is very safe from all of the pool data that we have from those single arm trials. We know that major complications, which are complications that result in hospitalization or needing some kind of intervention, are very low, uh, less than a half of a percentage. And that we know for the most part, PAE preserves sexual function. I say for the most part because for two reasons. One is I know for a fact that it can reduce the volume of ejaculate, and we think that's probably because of the fact that we're uh, killing glandular cells within the prostate that create fluid, or either that or we're blocking ejaculatory ducts. In some studies, this has been misrepresented. Some studies have reported that uh, retrograde ejaculation occurs from PAE, and that's not the case. And truthfully, what actually happened in those studies is that those patients had retrograde or dry ejaculation prior to the study starting, and it somehow got reported as a result of the study. And that's been a little bit of an issue for us. So that's kind of the summary of all the data. You can see that we, it's, it's, it's pretty good. We have a, a good argument for why PAE uh, should be an option for men to treat BPH. What I wanted to get into next is to talk about what are the challenges of PAE. PAE has, got a, has gotten a reputation of being a difficult procedure. So why is it a difficult procedure? Well, for one, you have to identify the prosthetic arteries, which can be tricky. Two, you have to get your microcatheter into the prostatic arteries. And three, when you're embolizing, you want to avoid non-target embolization like any other embolization procedure. And then a, other, away from the technique points, building a PAE practice in itself uh, can be very difficult. So why is identifying the prostatic artery difficult? Because of images like this. When you do an angiogram and there's arteries going every which way all over the screen, how are you supposed to identify the prostatic artery? Or if you wanna get a little more high tech, here's a, a 3D reconstruction of a cone beam CT. Again, arteries all over the place. Where is the prostatic artery? 
Well, the first step to be able to identify the prostatic artery is being familiar with the anatomy. And this is one of the best papers that we have on prostatic arterial anatomy that was published by the Portuguese group in 2010. And they looked at comb beam, I'm sorry, they looked at CTA and angiography. And what they found is in 150 hemipelvies, these were the incidences of, of the origins of the prostatic artery. You can see it, come, it can come from any branch of the anterior division of the intrailiac artery. Uh, most commonly, they found the intern, it came from the internal pedendal artery and as a joint trunk with the superior vesicle artery. Now, we as radiologists tend to like to look at things uh, in cross-sectional uh, uh, type of in cross-sectional imaging, and specifically in axial images. And so when we think about the prostatic arteries in an axial view, with the anterior being on top of the circle and posterior being down here, the arteries that are going to supply the glandular, the central part of the prostate, the part that we want to target in PAE, are going to come into the prostate in the one o'clock and 11 o'clock positions, and we'll call those the anterior lateral prostatic arteries. <clears throat> There are additional arteries that come in in the posterior aspect of the prostate in the five o'clock and seven o'clock positions, but those tend to supply the capsule of the prostate and the most inferior aspect of it and tend to not be our primary targets in PAE. There has been some discussion of targeting them as well, um, but at the very least at first you should go after these anterior lateral prostatic arteries. Some images from that same paper show these arteries on CTA. You can see in this image right here that artery coming in at that one o'clock and 11 o'clock position, those would be the arteries we would target. Here are those posterior lateral prostatic arteries giving, supplying the capsule, and also very commonly giving off a branch to the rectum. And that's why we don't routinely go after them. Although again, there is some discussion that maybe that should be the right thing to do. All right, so how do we make identifying the prostatic arteries easier? Well, the fir first thing we can do is get pre-imaging. So if we get pre-CTA, that's extremely helpful, especially in the beginning of your practice. Um, you can make some nice uh, MIP images with your CTA and different uh, projections. And you can see exactly, like in this picture right here, where the prostatic artery is arising from. And that's really helpful when you're uh, preparing for your procedure. This is a, so just a few uh, pieces of information from the CTA protocol that I developed for uh, PAE, CTA pelvis, using 150 cc contrast bolus. We were giving uh, pre-scan sublingual nitroglycerin. There is one paper on that to, that demonstrates better imaging with nitroglycerin. Um, the key was to put an, a region of interest in the lower abdominal aorta and then trigger, set the scan to trigger at 300 Hounsfield units. And if you do that, you get really pretty images of the pelvic arteries, especially the smaller ones. Now you can also do cone beam CTA. Now granted, this is gonna be on the same day as the patient's coming in for the procedure. So you're, you're missing out on the pre-planning that you could have, but it's really easy to get uh, great images of the prostatic arteries when you're injecting contrast, either directly into the abdominal aorta or into the internal iliac arteries to get these cone beam images. The key, one of the keys to remember here is to, to use 50% contrast for these uh, acquisitions. And then to remember to do a, a filling uh, period before you actually acquire the images. And whether, if you're doing it from the internal iliac, three seconds is fine, but if you're doing it from the aorta, more like five seconds. And if the patient can't hold still, these are, these are worth nothing. So it's really important that they can hold still for it. But the, the bread and butter is always going to be angiography. That's where you're really, you know, you really need to get comfortable with what you're going to see on angiography in order to, to do PAE. And our bread and butter is the ipsilateral oblique angiogram. Now, why do we do the ipsilateral oblique angiogram? Because it separates out the posterior and anterior divisions of the internal iliac artery. And that's really helpful when you're trying to get a catheter into the anterior division. This is, if there's anything that you take home from this talk, if, if people are just starting out in, in PAE or want to get into it, this is probably the best, the main lesson is how to go through and identify all of these arteries. So this is my uh, system for identifying the branches of the internal iliac artery. I start with the posterior division and the largest artery, it's usually the largest branch of the internal iliac is going to be the superior gluteal artery off the posterior division. Then going to the anterior division, you're gonna see two different arteries that travel in parallel with one another. 
really close to one another. And here you see one here and one here. And the one that is usually of greater caliber is gonna be the inferior gluteal artery. Now the smaller artery, artery that's traveling with it is gonna be the internal pedendal. And it is gonna travel with the inferior gluteal until it gets to the floor of the pelvis, at which point it makes a sharp turn anterior and heads toward the penis. Now we've identified all of the main branches of the internal iliac except for one, and that's gonna be this artery right here traveling, uh, coursing medially and anterior, and that's gonna be the obturator artery. And if I had occluded a little more of this image, you would see that it tends to um, terminate in a wishbone type of appearance. So there's two branches, a medial and lateral branch that, that form a wishbone, and that's a sure sign that that's the obturator artery. So those are all the major branches of the internal iliac. Now there's gonna be some smaller ones. There's usually this first one that comes off very early off the anterior division, and that's gonna be a superior vesicle branch. And it may also give off a branch to the umbilical region. There may be another one right after it. Sometimes, quite often, this is where the prostatic artery arises from. In this particular patient, this is gonna be a seminal vesicle branch. And then that leaves only one sizable artery that we can see on the screen that's, that's coming off right here off the obturator. And in this particular patient, the prostatic artery is arising from the obturator artery. Now, once you get your microcatheter into what you think is the prostatic artery, there are a couple ways to confirm that you're in the right spot. One way is just to do a selective angiogram, as you can see in this image, and you'll really see uh, a nice picture of, of the prostate. Prostatic arteries should be coursing more um, in the kind of transverse direction than, than vertical. Uh, and they tend to be corkscrew in appearance at times, kind of like these. Uh, and there'll be a prolonged um, abstain of the prostate. It shouldn't wash out very quickly. Another way to confirm you're in the right spot is to do a cone beam CT. You can do a hand injection of contrast. It only takes about a uh, CC or 1.5 CCs. And then you can go ahead and do a spin. And if you see your contrast outlining hemiprostate, you know you're in the right spot. All right, so let's move on from identifying the prostatic arteries to catheterizing the prostatic arteries. So we did a paper a few years ago that talked about um, what were the difficulties associated with getting good technical outcomes. And one of the main difficulties that we found, and I, this wasn't much of a surprise, was the tortuosity of the iliac arteries. If you have to deal with real tortuous iliac arteries, you're gonna lose support with your system, with your catheter system, and it's gonna make it harder to manipulate your catheter. So one thing that I like to do uh, these days is to really figure out what's my best access point to avoid as much tortuosity of the iliac arteries as possible. Sometimes, most of the time, it's right femoral is, is you know, pretty straightforward. Sometimes the right external iliac is really uh, tortuous, so I may want to go left femoral, and on occasion I may want to go bilateral uh, groins. And then there's always radial. If you have external iliacs that are, or, uh, that are tortuous, you can always go radial. So I just wanted to include a quick video in which I talk over kind of what my thinking process is when I'm doing this. What is going to be my access and my approach to getting to the prostate? So the options are groin, coming from above for radial, or actually bilateral groin could also be an uh, option. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the aorta here, and then I'm going to look at the tortuosity of the iliac arteries. And what we can see on the right is that we do have some tortuosity coming up. If we follow that artery upward, you can see it makes a little bit of a curve there, nothing major. And then we can also see that the bifurcation is pretty steep. And when we come down on the left, there's actually a bigger loop there. Now, I would be a little bit concerned if I was coming from the right groin that I would go up and over that steep bifurcation and then have to deal with this somewhat tortuous common iliac on the left and then get into the internal, which is right there. So I'm not sure that I wanna come from the right to be able to go to the left. Um, coming from the left in itself is not so great because then you have to deal with this loop um, going over to the right. Coming from above is an option, you could do radial, um, but with radial, you still have to come down and deal with this and then get into here and that eats up a lot of your catheter and sometimes can um, limit your uh, torquability of the catheter and such. So I think for this case, I've decided that I'm gonna access bilateral groins. It adds a little more time to the case and a little more risk of an access hematoma, but I think overall that's the best option. So that's kind of uh, how I go about thinking when I have uh, a CT available ahead of time, uh, figuring out where my access site is gonna be. 
there are other things that you can do with your CT, especially CTA ahead of time to help you plan for your case. One thing I used to do when I started out almost every case would I would take my CTA and I would turn it into a 3D reconstruction. And then I would play with it, play with the different obliquities and figure out what were the angles that I was gonna be able to see uh, the prostatic arteries best. And that way I had a game plan coming in to the case and I could replicate uh, my 3D images with my uh, DSA images so that I had a reference. I knew where I was and, and, and how to get where I wanted to go and what angles to use. It's also important to have the right tools. So a small microcatheter is obviously really important. I put 2.4 or less. In my mind, two, two French is probably the, the, the best, best size because it gets in everywhere you want to go. You can still use 018 coils. Uh, and so that's really my bread and butter is a two French catheter for these. You also need a good microwire. I like a shapeable one, one that you can shape and then reshape potentially. Um, the ones that I tend to use most are a Fathom 014 and a, uh, a Meister uh, by Asahi. Uh, those, uh, those are good. I also occasionally will go to a double angle GT. So those are kind of the three that I use. Um, and then as far as other, other catheters or wires that you, you might, or other catheters you might wanna have available, definitely an angle, angled microcatheter. That has bailed me out of a lot of cases. Um, one that has a good angle on it, I tend to use the uh, burn direction, I think. Um, and so there are some origins of prostatic arteries that are really tough to get into and that catheter uh, has saved me a bunch. So I know some people that like tip deflecting microcatheters like Swift Ninja. Um, I've tried it a few times, hasn't been the best for me, but um, I know people who really uh, appreciate those. And then a balloon, balloon occlusion microcatheters, um, I've done a lot of work with these. They, they have a lot of value in certain situations. And so that's something that you might also consider. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a, in a few slides. All right, so what about guidance? So here's a short video showing a radial PAE. I'm coming up from the, the arm there with, um, I use a glide wire to go up and over. Uh, and a lot of people don't do that, but, and that's a 125 vertebral catheter, five French. Uh, and so I'm coming down. And so in this case, I'm using my 3D model from my CTA to guide me once I get into the, the uh, pelvis here. And so it's just showing me how to get into the internal iliac. And now I know from looking at my CTA ahead of time, that the prostatic artery is arising from the obturator, which I'm now struggling to get a wire into. But there we go, we slip that five French into that obturator, do a, a DSA run, see the prostatic artery, then use the microcatheter to get into the prostatic artery and, uh, and do the injection there. You can see the prostate and that's our post embolization uh, floral loop. Now you can see I use multiple types of guidances there. I used the, the 3D image from the CTA as my initial guidance, but when that ran out, meaning it no longer imaged the smaller vessels, I went to using a DSA run uh, with a DSA overlay, which was helpful. All right, so that's kind of, you know, the different things we use to get into the prostatic arteries. How about preventing non-target embolization? Well, uh, I guess I should have warned you about this. There are some pictures coming up that you may, if you, if you don't wanna look at a, a man's behind or his genitalia, you may wanna turn away right now. This is what can happen from non-target embolization. So if you had cutaneous, um, if you had non-target embolization, embolization to cutaneous branches from the inferior gluteal artery, this is what would happen. I'll tell you that this bothered him mildly for a little while and then it, it got better and he was fine with no long-term sequelae. Uh, this is what happens on the penis if it goes down, uh, if you have non-target to the glands of the penis, you get this modeling of the penis, uh, as well as some crusting. If you look right around the urethral meatus, there is a little bit of crusting. This is concerning, obviously, and it hurts uh, to some degree for the patient. Um, after about two to three weeks with just conservative care, preventing it from getting infected, uh, it heals up on its own with no residual deficits. All right, so there's two possibilities of how this can occur, right? It can either happen from reflux or it can happen through distal anastomoses. And I will tell you in the pelvic vasculature and the pelvic arteries, there are so many anastomoses all around. And so it's something to keep in mind at all times. Um, and so how do you prevent reflux? Well, uh, you know, like any other procedure you're doing, slow injection, and I like dilute particles to keep them from clumping. So I'd say slow injection of dilute particles. My technique, I use a one cc syringe. I inject in very small aliquots, watch them, watch them flow downstream, uh, and then inject again. I tend to not go to stasis with my particles. 
I think that it tends to put you at higher risk for uh, reflux or, or even uh, putting particles through anastomosis. So I tend to stop when it's sluggish and finish with a, a, a relatively thick gel foam slurry um, that acts as to like, almost like a liquid embolic for me. And then the, finally, to prevent reflux, if you wanted to, a balloon occlusion microcatheter is a really good way to prevent reflux. So you'll have to bear with me. I created these uh, graphics of the prostate, as you can tell. Um, but we're going to talk about different ways now to deal with distal anastomosis. So we talked about how to deal with reflux, but how do you deal with distal anastomosis? Well, you can see, you know, here's the, all the arteries of the prostate. And here is an artery that's going down inferiorly, either toward the penis or the rectum, uh, anastomosing into the other arteries here. So one way is to get your microcatheter distal to the origin of that anastomotic vessel and then embolize from there. Obviously, you still have to, you have to be very careful about reflux in that, re in that situation. Another way to do it, and probably the most common way that we deal with it, is actually to coil embolize the anastomosis, that way protecting any of the distal organs from the particles that you're injecting, and then you can inject with a little more um, uh, gusto, so to speak, not worry about uh, reflux as much. This is a, a paper or case report published a while back about coil embolization. Um, you can see we're in the prostatic artery here. We're seeing the prostate, but we're also seeing additional blush. And this blush here is very characteristic of rectum and the way these arteries are coursing in a vertical fashion and a parallel. Um, and when we did the cone beam CT, you could see the rectal wall enhancing with our injection. And so we went back and we went into that straight artery that was there and put a coil, uh, pulled back again and then injected again. And on our next cone beam, now you see that it's there's no rectal enhancement, it's just the left hemiprostate. So that's, that's another way. Another way that you can deal with it, if the anastomosis is small, is, is uh, inject what I consider larger particles. Now, larger particles in this case are, in my mind, are greater than 250 micron. So maybe you're using 300 to 500 microsphere, maybe you're using 400 embosine or hydroporyl or one of those. Um, but I, all those would be, I would consider on the, the, the bigger range. Now, there's a couple more, and these are a little more abstract. There was a paper on using verapamil to selectively dilate up the arteries within the prostate. Um, and uh, I, I think that works sometimes, but it's not a, a reliable effect that I, can, I see every time. Alternatively, you can use a balloon occlusion catheter. And to me, this is the real value of these microcatheters. It's not so much to prevent reflux, but it's to change the flow, to redirect the flow. And so when you block the systemic blood pressure here, you create a very low pressure area here, which in turn draws up the blood from below. And in that way, you're creating a pressure gradient that favors injection of particles into the prostate instead of down this way. And, and, that, and that can save you from non-target embolization. Here's a couple images using a, a balloon occlusion catheter. This is with the balloon down. What we're seeing again is mostly rectum. Again, you see these kind of vertically oriented parallel arteries. Once we put the balloon up, now we're seeing more of these corkscrew type arteries that are, are consistent with prostate. Uh, and this, um, which was right here, that was supplying the rectum is no longer filling as much. Just to prove it to you, we did a cone beam CT with the balloon up and the balloon down. So this is with the balloon down. We see a lot, and it's a, it's a coronal image. You're seeing a lot of uh, enhancement of the rectal wall. And this, when we put the balloon up, same cut, now you're not seeing that enhancement of the rectal wall anymore. Similar here with these axial images of the prostate, balloon down, there's a little bit of uh, contrast going into the prostate. When you put the balloon up, now you have a much more um, pronounced effect of, of contrast going into the prostate. All right, so one other video to kind of illustrate a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about. I already have a five French catheter up and over the bifurcation. I'm using a 3D uh, rendered image from a CTA to guide where my catheter is going. I already know from viewing the, the CTA ahead of time that this is going to be the prostatic artery right here. So I'm headed down into it. Uh, trying to get my wire to go down, and then the microcatheter follows. Once I get down here, now I'm, again, I'm switching to DSA imaging. What we're seeing here, though, is this straight artery that runs just along the capsule of the prostate. And that's going to be that's going to be called a lateral accessory pedendal artery. And it's always going to anastomose with one of the pedendal, internal pedendals, either contralateral or ipsilateral. And so in this case, you have to do one of two things. You either have to go deep to it or distal to it uh, and just get the prostate, or you have to coil embolize it or do one of the techniques that I talked about earlier. In this case, we decided to put a coil in it. So I just deployed a coil uh, and now I'm pulling back and you can see the coil there. There's the run that shows that it's now occluded and I'm gonna embolize proximally after coiling it off. And so I'm embolizing right now. Uh, again, I'm gonna embolize till 
I get pretty much sluggish flow. And then I'm going to go ahead and switch uh, to my gel foam slurry. So you can see we're not, it's almost, it's pruned. It's not quite stasis. Um, I'm trying to do right now what's called the perfected technique, which describes uh, advancing your catheter deeper into the prostate once you've reached near stasis and trying to inject more. Um, so I'm still getting reflux, so I'm not going to keep doing that. And now I'm injecting the gel foam slurry. Uh, that is a mixture of a full gel foam sponge with what I do these days is eight cc's of contrast and two cc's of saline to make a nice thick slurry. And you can see as I'm, I'm pulling out, as I'm injecting it to leave a cap on, in the artery. And that uh, makes me feel better that I'm not going to have revascularization of that artery or recanalization of that artery quickly. All right, so now I'll go back and do the same thing on the other side. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the last challenge, which is building a PAE practice. It's, this is one of the most difficult things anyone who's you know, started to do PAE will tell you because it's really difficult to get referrals. I'm fortunate at UNC that I have really great colleagues in urology who have been open uh, to hearing about PAE, to being co-investigators on PAE studies. And I feel like they're very honest about uh, referring people and, and, and uh, we work well together. So I'm grateful for that, but not everyone has that luxury. Uh, so here are some key statements to share with your urology colleagues. PAE is not replacing TERP. That is the wrong attitude to go into uh, trying to create a collaboration. It is basically a procedure that can fill holes in the treatment algorithm. Well, what are those holes? Patients with surgical comorbidities that can't undergo a procedure that requires anesthesia, uh, patients who are on anticoagulation, patients with extremely large prostates who only have a few choices, and then patients with hematuria, um, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone, treat their hematuria, also treat their, their BPH urinary symptoms. What about the uh, Amer American Urologic Association BPH treatment guidelines? If you know anything about PPA, uh, PAE, this has been a controversial issue within the IR community uh, or the PAE community for some time. There's been a couple iterations of this that have included PAE. The most recent was published last year and still said, despite all of the uh, studies that I showed you earlier, that PAE should only be performed in the setting of a clinical trial, which was very frustrating to a lot of people who do PAE like myself. Um, and it's because it, it makes it harder to get reimbursement in some ways and also to convince other urologists to send patients. Uh, and the problem with this, this recommendation is that if you look at the, the committee, there's a lot of people who have been champions of some of the competitive procedures like Eurolift, Resume. Uh, and so it makes it hard to think that there's not some conflict of interest. Um, since those guidelines came out uh, in 2020, there have been uh, two more RCTs that have been published and that also that RCT versus sham. So there is additional data since then, although I've heard some whisperings that the next iteration of these guidelines are not gonna change, which is, Again, extremely frustrating. All right, so that's kind of, um, that's the where, where we've been or how we've got here. And now I wanna talk about some of the things that are on the horizon with PAE and where we are going. Uh, the first thing is let's go back to some of those challenges that we were talking about, identifying the prostatic artery. So uh, my practice has evolved over the, the years. I've been doing this now, doing PAE since um, for about seven years, I think. And, um, this is, this is where I'm currently at. I showed you kind of where I've come from, but this is where I'm currently at. So I'm gonna show you a video now. Uh, I've already done a selective internal iliac comb beam CTA. Um, and now I'm show you what I do when I review the images. So we have our images in three planes. And what I'm doing is looking at the axial images and trying to figure out in my mind where the prostatic artery is arising from. Now I'm using a tool on the MIP image here that's going to extract the, the vascular tree from everything around it and remove the bones. So now you have a 3D image of the vascular tree. I take a look at it here. The next step is to go ahead and use software that actually can show you the path from the starting point to where you wanna end up in the prostate. And I use this kind of like CAD, like people would use CAD. I get my own idea of where I think it is. And then I check with the computer to see if we agree with one another. And most of the time we do. Sometimes I'm wrong, sometimes the computer's wrong, but, um, but that's how I use this tool. And you can see what it creates for you is a colored, a shaded um, overlay on the 3D uh, model that can then be overlaid on your live fluoro to help you get into the prosthetic artery. All right, so what about catheterizing the prosthetic artery? Well, here's the continuation. So I've already done 
that previous part. And now I'm going to show you how I actually use the color in the case. And I apologize for some of the quality. This case was actually today. <laughs> so I made this video earlier today. So you can see that's where I'm trying to get, right? This, this artery is, is the artery to the prostate. And so I have my uh, catheter five French here. Um, I've collimated down very small so I can get the highest resolution possible. I'm using digital zoom, not actual magnification, which is reducing my radiation dose uh, quite a bit. But in order to do that, I have to collimate uh, a lot. Um, and now I'm getting my wire has gone down into the artery. It's not quite the right artery. It's, it's, it's a, a branch off the same trunk. And so what I'm going to do as soon as I get that, that uh, I'll try a few times to get into the right artery, but then I'm going to bring my micro catheter down uh, in a second here. And the great thing about having these 3D models is you can rotate them without having to reshoot your DSA image. So now I still have guidance uh, and I can rotate it any way I want and not have to keep acquiring DSA images and using radiation dose. Um, and so at this point, I just cut to the chase here. I've got my wire and microcatheter down into the prostatic artery. And I know that because I have that overlay that I created earlier to show me. So that's kind of what I'm doing these days. It's been really helpful and, and resulted in a lot of lower dose uh, easier PAEs. There, are, there is some new equipment out there that I'm excited about. This, this True Select 175 centimeter catheter came out uh, a few months ago, or it's been about six months now, maybe. Um, it's a two French catheter that's 175 centimeters. So it's longer than any other peripheral catheter that we have available. And so it allows for transradial PAE in taller patients, um, which can be helpful in a lot of circumstances. As far as embolics go, I don't think we know the exact right one yet. You know, we, we argue about size, um, you know, which one to use. There's been a couple papers that have just been very early looks at liquid embolics or drug eluting embolics for PA. Uh, and so I'm not sure where we're going to go there. But at this point, uh, there's really no consensus on what is the right size or which embolic is the right one for PAE. There is a lot of chatter lately about coil embolizing the main prostatic artery after you've particle embolized it. Uh, and I'm waiting for some data to, to see how that works out in the long run. Um, but that might be something that helps us get increased durability of the effect of PAE, but that's, we're still kind of waiting to see on that one. All right, so what about building a PAE practice? What's, what's new there? Well, as far as the AUA guidelines go, we just talked about that a minute ago. You know, a lot of times this is how we feel in the PAE community about that. It's just, it's just frustrating and, and we don't know what to do. There are several options of things that we can potentially do. So one thing we can do is try to keep collecting very high quality data, hoping that it will eventually sway them to include PAE in the guidelines. For example, the SIR Foundation announced it's funding a multi-center PAE or sham trial called ProArt. Um, and the point of this is to create data specifically to um, get PAE into the guidelines. One thing that I'm not crazy about this trial is I think we already know that PAE is better than sham. And I feel like we're just doing it to get in the guidelines and not actually uh, discovering or get, getting new information about PAE, which I, I, would, I would prefer. Um, as far as there's another route, right? Instead of relying on the guidelines to change, we could address urologists on an individual level and show them the data we have and say, look, you know, there may be some reasons why your society's committee is, is conflicted. Why don't you look at the data and uh, you know, decide for yourself? And I think that's actually a really good approach. I think waiting for the AUA guidelines to change, we could, we could grow very old waiting for that. Um, the last possible uh, way to potentially spread PAE is maybe we start doing joint venture OBLs with urology and remove that financial barrier that keeps them from referring patients. I know of this happening in a couple places and it's amazing when urologists start profiting off PAE, uh, immediately how many patients are good for PAE at that point. And so potentially that's an answer in the future. One uh, article that came out this past year or two years ago now, I guess a uh, year and a half, that was, that's, that's very promising is this article that includes uh, uh, Dr. Rareborn, who's, who's uh, one of the giants within BPH uh, treatment. And they put out this article discussing the minimally invasive therapies associated with um, P with BPH. And you can see here's their treatment algorithm. And it's wonderful in that PAE is included uh, in each of the appropriate positions. And I believe that if we can get to a place where there is not uh, financial uh, interference, there's no conflicts that keep coming up, and we just think about 
what's best for patients, this is the treatment algorithm or this something very similar that we could use where if they fall into each of these categories, each of the options could be explained and the patient can decide which of those treatments they wanna go with. I wanna talk about a few more papers that have come out that I think have shed some, some light and, and are kind of shaping the future of PAE. This was the 10 year experience from Dr. Carnavali, one of the pioneers of PAE from Brazil. Um, and what he showed was as he followed these patients out, now granted you have to look at the sample size as he gets out to the later years, it gets it dwindles. But excuse me, if you look at four to five years, you can see his efficacy rate um, was up, up near 70%. Um, and so uh, that is, I think that's, that's helpful. So when patients ask, how long does, is my PAE going to last? You say our best data shows that, you know, at about five years or so, somewhere between four or five years, 50% of people are still um, having good effect at four to five years. Another paper came out from the Portuguese group looking at repeat PAEs, because this kind of follows if a patient relapses and gets another PAE, what's their chance of success? Well, they, they split the patients into two groups, uh, relapsers, patients who initially responded and then had recurrence of symptoms and patients who never responded. And the patients who initially responded, if you look at their uh, success rate, they have a, about a 60% success rate. Uh, and so that's what I quote to people who are coming back for a PAE if they initially responded. I say, if we do it again, you have a, about a 60% chance of clinical success. If you're a non-responder initially, it's much lower. And, and I, I think those are patients that should probably go and have a different procedure. This is something I'm very excited about, and that is uh, PAE in the radiation oncology field, because I think there's a huge opportunity here for us to play a part in, in these patients' treatments and help them. Um, and I think radiation oncology would be happy to have us. So in one, one possibility is that, and, and this is a big group, patients who are getting treated with radiation for prostate cancer who then develop urinary symptoms. There are not a lot of surgical options for those patients because their surgical margins become very difficult to identify. And so urologists are very hesitant to do anything surgical for those patients. These are patients that we can really help out with PAE. They are gonna be harder cases because you're gonna be working in uh, radi radiated arteries, but I think, I think it's, a, it's a great place for us to, to move forward. And, and there was a paper that talked about that recently. And then there's a couple, a couple papers, that was a case report in this paper that talked about the potential for uh, shrinking the prostate, reducing its size in preparation for uh, radiation so that the radiation that they provide uh, can be uh, more comprehensive and less and, and, and not as um, uh, and have less side effects. And so that's another place that we could potentially uh, play a role is when these patients are getting ready um, to undergo radiation treatment. And then finally, this thing, uh, this is going to be huge. I, I just know it. Um, I'm excited about it. This is the work they're doing in Northwestern right now, looking at actual treatment of prostate cancer with Y90 via the prostatic artery. Uh, the reason I think this is going to be a big thing is because we know radiation works to treat prostate cancer, but we could actually treat prostate cancer and either A, prevent lower urinary tract symptoms while radiation oncologists are, are actually causing them, and two, not only we could prevent them, we could potentially treat existing lower urinary tract symptoms in addition to cancer. And so this, this, this has huge potential and I'm excited to see uh, the human studies that are gonna follow. Um, I am just gonna finish up with one case here and then, and then we'll be done. Uh, and I just wanna go through this real quick to show you kind of what happens in these repeat cases. This is a 59 year old male, uh, 10 year history of LUTs. And this is gonna be about six years ago. He was only taking herbal supplements and getting up three times a night. And you can see his IPSS at 22 that falls in the severe category. And so here is his ipsilateral oblique angiogram. Again, if you go through the anatomy, here's the superior gluteal artery. Here are those two traveling in parallel that I talked about, uh, the inferior gluteal and the internal pedendal. You can see how they diverge from one another. The internal pedendal goes towards the penis while the inferior glute goes back towards the gluteal muscles. We do not see the obturator in this case because it, this is one of those corona mortis variants. That's where the obturator arises from the inferior epigastric artery off the external iliac. And that happens in about a third of people, so we're not seeing that. In this particular case, we see the superior vesicle artery and we see an artery coming down here that could be the prostatic artery. And then we see another artery arising from the internal pedendal that could also be the prostatic. So what we did was we took the catheter and we got into this one first coming down and we injected. And what we saw was 
the prostate, but we also saw the, the contrast refluxing or going backwards through the synastomosis into the other artery coming off of the internal pedendal. So we embolized, and when we were done embolizing, we no longer saw any blush in the prostate. All we saw was this anastomosis was still patent into the internal pedendal. And you can imagine, you have to be real careful with your particles because you don't want them going back through and then down the internal pedendal. On the right side, again, we'll do, can do the anatomy here. You see the uh, superior gluteal. This is a variant where the inferior gluteal comes off the superior gluteal. And here is the um, internal pedendal coming down here. Again, even though they have a variant origin, they're still traveling together. And then as far as, uh, and actually there's, a, there's an obturator here, you're only seeing part of it, but here's the obturator. Uh, and then there's two options for the prostatic. There's this right here coming off again of the superior vesicle, or there's this big guy right here coming off the internal pedendal, kind of similar to the other side. Well, we got into this one first again and looked. And in this case, we saw something weird. This did not look like prostate. And when we did the cone beam CT, we could actually see that it was the seminal vesicle located here and not the prostate. So we did not embolize there. We got into the other big branch, which was this one, and it did our embolization or did our angiogram. And you could see now you're seeing some prostate here and we embolized there. Well, the patient did well initially. One month, at one month, he was doing great. IPSS down to seven, quality of life zero. He important improved libido. I will tell you that's not from PAE. That's probably from him stopping. Well, he wasn't on meds, but you really, you, we don't see this. If it, was, if it was in this case, it might've been kind of a placebo effect, um, but he was doing quite well. Six months later, he started to say he was having a little more relapse of symptoms. He was getting up twice a night. And then in two and a half years later, he's now having recurrence of symptoms, getting up two to three times a night. Still not as bad as he was in the beginning, but, but getting worse. So he decided to come back for a repeat angiogram. I included this one coronal uh, image from his cone beam just to show that there's a patent artery on the left side. Um, we ended up not doing uh, one of these. This is from the first study, but I'll tell you that we saw on the CTA, on the cone beam CTA, that this was the artery now that was supplying his prostate. So that one off the internal pedendal. So we got in there, we did the injection, and now what do we see? A really nice angiogram of the prostate, including this part of the median lobe up top here. And so we embolized there. So what this shows you is that even though we saw, we saw stasis on the previous one and we did not see any blush at the end of our previous embolization, there's now complete revascularization of the left hemiprostate from this artery that we left, uh, that we did not embolize through. Again, looking just to show you, there's a patent artery on the right side. We went to the right side. It was this little, this is what we embolized last time. A lot of times when you embolize, especially if you use gel foam, this is what your artery will look like, very skimpy and kind of irregular. Uh, and we saw this irregular blush here. I advanced the catheter a little bit deeper. And now I saw an outline of the prostate. Not much, but we did our embolization there. But the key is when you do a repeat, you have to look at the distal internal pedendal and the distal uh, obturator arteries for any arteries that might be coming up from underneath. And so that's where we are right now in the distal internal pedendal. And here is, sure enough, here is this artery coming off the distal internal pedendal, heading up to the prostate. Advanced our catheter into that. And now you see this nice outline of not only the right side of the prostate, but also the left as well, and this anastomosis to the left internal pedendal. And so we got deep into it and treated very gently um, and was able to embolize more of the prostate by coming into this underside. And I, one of my urology colleagues named this artery the pina cava, and that name has stuck with me and now I use it in all my talks. So this is the pina cava. Um, three years later, the patient's sleeping through most nights. He can hold his urine, he's just doing great. He's peeing pretty, pretty much normally without any medications. And so that's, that's wonderful. So what were the lessons learned from that case? Uh, so, you know, there was probably proximal clumping of my, of my particles that kept them from um, getting uh, deep into the prostate. And that's why the prostate was easily revascularized. And then you should also look for those distal branches initially and, and potentially put coils in them so that they don't become the conduits through which the prostate is revascularized. So I wanna give you a summary just of what we talked about tonight. Um, we looked at some of the challenges of PAE, where we were and where we're going. Um, and these, these are the challenges, finding, catheterizing, preventing non-target and building a practice. Um, my bold prediction is the way things are going, I think PAEs are gonna increase in the US fivefold in the next five years. So I think last year there was something like five or 6,000 done in the US. So I think it's gonna be huge in the next five years just because it's, it's getting more and more acceptance and we're getting uh, more and more reimbursement, even though it's in some places it's going slowly. I do wanna give a quick uh, plug to the course that I uh, co-direct. 
myself and Dr. Sundeep Bagla, we co-direct this course. Uh, it's gonna be live. Uh, it's about time we have a live course again in September in DC. So if anyone's interested in learning more about PAE, we not only talk about PAE, we talk about other kind of um, avant-garde uh, embolization procedures uh, like uh, hemorrhoids, like shoulder, like knee. And now we've also included a ablation for pain uh, session in this as well. It's gonna be a great meeting. Um, I think before we finish up though, we have to maybe hear from Ben Franklin one more time. Dr. Isaacson, that was an electrifying talk, but I have to ask you, do you have any solutions to hemorrhoids? So I wanna thank you and I, I'd open it up for any questions if anyone has any questions at this point. Thanks, sorry, that was, that was great. Um, the, uh, for anybody that does have any questions that aren't in the Q&A section, please add them. Um, the uh, one question that we have, um, I've used two, uh, 250 micron particles with good aggressive embolic effect. Several have had significant dysuria, which lingers for months, refractory to meds and some sloughing at cysto. You think it's just those patients slash prostates, too aggressive embo versus two small particles, any tips? Yes. Let's say, mute yourself, Steven. Okay. So I, I guess um, the, uh, I, I go through, I, I waver um, and what size particles I use. And, and, and a lot of it has to do with what you're talking about. I think in my heart of hearts, I think we're going to get a more durable embolization if we use smaller particles. So like a 250 size, I think you're going to have a more durable embolization. But you, you run into these situations where these patients, like you said, have dysuria for, and you have to keep, they keep coming back and you're, you're, you don't know what to do for them. You give them, you know, steroids over and over again, try to get that inflammation down. And so when that tends to happen and it overwhelms me, I tend to lean more towards 400 size particles. And that's kind of where I am right now. I tend to use 400 for a lot of the patients just because uh, I think if they do have to come back in the future, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. I'd rather them do that than suffer with dysuria for, for several months. But but I, that's, I just certainly don't think I'm 100% right on that. And I, and I know that people would debate me other ways and I, and I, I don't claim to, to, to know it all on that one. All right, can you talk about some of the guidance systems that you were showing um, you know, with, uh, with reference to finding the uh, vessels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one I'm currently using is you can see the machine in the background, that's a GE system, it's a discovery. Um, and they have, a, they have software called Embo Assist. Um, which is, the, that's the workflow I showed you. Pretty much every platform I think has a version of that, uh, Philips and Siemens. Um, and so uh, I, I think they all do it. And it's, I don't, I'm not, um, I haven't used Philips or Siemens version of it. So I can't really give you my thoughts on that. But, but I do think if you have that available, it has the potential to make your case easier and reduce your radiation per case um, by utilizing all of the kind of bells and whistles that you have available. Yeah, I mean, this seems like a perfect use case for kind of the AR VR space. Um, you know, I don't, I haven't done uh, PAE work, but just in terms of our ablation work, we've we've found the difficult anatomies and stuff really, you know, is kind of built for uh, VR AR is, is a is a good tool that way. So uh, I think you'll see some of that, and I think just getting getting people comfortable with all of those variants, whether it be a large database that SAR or any of these large groups would would curate so that people could go through like you do with your course, seeing a lot of the different anatomic variants. Cause I think that that's what allows you to, you know, be much, much more rapid in doing the, doing the procedure is that you've already seen those, all of those variants and you kind of have a map in your mind when you see it, you're like, you recognize it. And that's kind of like what I think a lot of the junior folks just getting into the space, what, what holds them back. Yeah, I agree. I, I, you know, I think one of the best things you can do as a trainee or as a, as a, a new attending or someone new to PAE is just to look, find some cases and just look at the cases, look, look at as many cases as you can, angiograms, and really understand what the anatomy does, where the variants tend to be. Um, and the, you're right, the more familiarity you have with it, the easier it is to identify what you have to do and what pitfalls to look out for. Um, Ari, one of the other questions is asking, um, what are your routine discharge medications? Yeah, good question. So uh, I, I give three days of antibiotics. Uh, my go-to is Bactrim these days uh, for three days. 
I give, I really, the main thing that we're trying to overcome for the patients to show improvement, which by the way, doesn't happen immediately. It takes, you know, a good a week or two, most likely two to really start noticing some things is to overcome the inflammation that we've created by the ischemia. Um, and so I, I, I kind of fight off the inflammation in, in two ways, one with steroids. So I'll give a Medrol dose pack and then also with non-steroidal. So I'll give uh, a week of naproxen, 500 milligrams BID, uh, where I breakfast dinner for a week. And then finally, uh, those are the main three. And then I also, I give just a few Percocet and not because I anticipate they're gonna be in a lot of pain, but there are uh, symptoms that patients always tend to experience the first night and day after the procedure. Uh, and, and this can be really irritating and bothersome. Uh, and you know, I find that they, and they often have some degree of discomfort. It's usually mild to moderate, but if they take a Percocet, it tends to help them get them through I don't know. I don't think those are, are definitely necessary, though. There are other options too. I, I, I've had different regimens over the years. You can offer peridium. It's another good option. A, an analgesic for the urinary system uh, turns the, the urine orange. Uh, and then there's also anticholinergics that can prevent bladder spasm, uh, like uh, ditropan, which is um, oxybutynin. Um, the problem with those, or the danger with those, is that if a patient is on the brink of not being able to pee, that might make them go into complete retention. So. I, I'm careful with the use of that one. Okay. Um, in addition to CTA, are you still getting MR before or after? So I never did, uh, really. The only time I ever did was when I did my initial clinical trial uh, way back. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't really see the value in it unless you're doing, uh, unless you're doing a trial. I mean, trial, it helps you to identify how much of the prostate is glandular, you know, how much is the adenoma of the prostate, uh, and it allows you to really see how much is devascularized when you're done. I don't know that clinically that's all that relevant. Uh, it's more about how the patient is doing symptom-wise. I think getting a CT or a CTA ahead of time is helpful because it gives you information like we discussed in this talk. Uh, you know, what do the iliacs look like? How much calcification of the arteries is there? What's the volume of the prostate? Those are the key things I'm picking up from my pre-imaging. Um, but so I, I, I don't, I, you can get an MRI, but I don't think it's, it's, it's completely necessary. Okay. Um, one of the questions I had, uh, we, we've done only a handful in our group and um, the, our urology uh, section has been a little bit slow to, uh, to adopt PE for sure. And the cases that we have gotten, um, we've run into issues with insurance approval. So it's been kind of deflating where, okay, you know, over the course of a year, maybe they send us a handful and half of them get denied. So it kind of um, almost, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I guess it just creates another barrier. And I just didn't know how have you gotten past that? Um, and have you run into that sort of an issue in North Carolina? Yeah, so I guess the question would be, were those patients Medicare patients or were they private insured patients? Um, or it's the one that I had was Medicare. One of my partners had one, which I think was private actually. Okay. So, you know, the way Medicare works is that they don't, there's no pre, uh, you, you know, you, you can't, you can't get a pre-approval for a Medicare patient or, or anything like that. You basically billing them a code. And at some point in the future, if someone from CMS or your local CMS, uh, kind of, um, administrator, uh, feels that it was, you know, Fraud, fraudulent, they'll come back and, and audit you or whatever. Um, so Medicare should pay really in, in most because we're using codes that are Medicare friendly. They're the embolization code 37243, which we use for, for uterine fibroid embolization or for liver embolization. Uh, so that code should work for Medicare patients. And usually, you know, Medicare patients tend to have a supplemental policy to cover the residual 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. Uh, and so those tend to follow suit with Medicare. There's a few exceptions. Private payers are a little bit trickier. Um, we've getting more and more success with private payers as time goes by. Um, I'll tell you one quick anecdote. There's our biggest holdout in, um, in North Carolina was actually Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I hear that a lot across the country that they're the ones that are most difficult. Them and Cigna tend to be the ones that are most difficult to pay for it. Um, and so they weren't paying. And so basically uh, one day someone who has a very high up position in our hospital system um, came to me and wanted to have a, a PAE. And he said, I, I told him, well, you have the state health plan, the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, you know, you, they won't pay for it. And so he said, you know, give me a, give me a day or two. And so, so he contacted the medical director of, of Blue Cross Blue Shield where we are and, 
and had a discussion and talked about the evidence and all that stuff. And, and, and now we're able to get it paid for. And so sometimes it just takes someone with influence to be able to break through the barrier there and, and talk to the, so I don't know if that helps your situation. Um, but I think overall, we're moving in the right direction with that. Um, the AUA guidelines are still a, a bit of, a, they still represent a big obstacle for us because the, it's easy for the insurance companies to fall back on that and say they're not paying. Um, but you know, I, there we've compiled good letters to the insurance companies that have summarized all the data. And so, I, if you don't have one of those, I suggest you know trying to write one or get one from somebody um, that summarizes all the randomized control trials that are available and, and and shows them that there is a lot of data supporting the procedure. Okay. So to that to that end, Ari, if yeah. if you were in in the um, you know best of worlds, if um, you know if payers were paying and you had a collegial relationship as you do with your urology colleagues, how do you kind of triage patients towards one thing or another? You know, I'm a, I'm a lung ablation guy, so I go to lung tumor board and we decide whether they're gonna get SBRT versus lung ablation. But how does that happen? Because I imagine these patients kind of don't go through a tumor board and it kind of just lands in a urologist lap of, of symptoms. That's correct. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in an ideal world, we would have a, a multidisciplinary conference, right, <laughs> for BPH, like a patient would come in, we'd go through talk about, but that's, you're right, that's not how it works. I mean, they, they either, they're, they're coming from primary care, they're coming from urology, the majority of them are coming from urology. And so the only way to really uh, get there in that sense is to convince your urologist that it has a place, like I said, that there are patients who are going to be, you know, 85 year old guys with really big prostates who have excuse me, COPD and congestive heart failure and can't undergo another procedure, hey, they're perfect uh, for a PAE. Um, or there's a, you know, someone who can't come off anticoagulation and no one wants to touch them with their big prostate. So they could come to you for a PAE. So you, you really need to make the urologist aware that that option is available, that they can send you those people. Um, and then the other thing I would say is uh, after they do send you those people, make sure you return them for follow-up so that the urologist can see the effect that you have on these patients and then realize that it's a good, it's a good decision for the future. Um, you know, other things are that, that patients drive these procedures a lot because there are a lot of men who really don't want to have a transurethral procedure. That's just, just the thought of it is not something they want to deal with. And so, um, you know, having really good web presence uh, to be able for, for patients to be able to find you and kind of bypass that as a whole is another good option. But I would also say, if they do do that, it's great to be able to send them to urology, assuming you have a understanding that they're not going to be, you know, hijacked away from you, uh, to show that this is a give and take that, uh, you know, I would like to send the patients who want to have a PAE for the right workup with you guys. And then, you know, with the understanding that I'll do their PAE, and then maybe they'll follow up with you afterward. And ultimately, that kind of uh, attitude can, can grow a urologist practice. Um, so I think there's benefit, is benefit in multiple ways. And the truth is, when you look at the numbers financially, a TERP doesn't really, doesn't pay all that well. But all of the procedures associated with BPH workup, like a cystoscopy and a truss and a, a transrectal ultrasound and and all, all those and the things that you might have afterwards, like your dynamics or, or before, that stuff ends up being a lot more money. So if a patient comes to you and then they end up going through that workup with the urologist, the urologist is actually coming out on, on top in the end. You got to explain that to them. It's, it's not easy. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's kind of, you know, in, in our own space, I get patients all the time who are self-referred or referred from medical oncology for ablation. And, and I look at it and I say, you know, this is a fairly, this would be a fairly high risk procedure for me. I think you should go to radiation oncology. So right. I wonder whether someone's starting a practice, if, particularly if they look at one of your CTAs, pre, you know, pre-procedure CTAs and said, wow, this is going to be a very, very tough anatomy for to negotiate. Maybe this patient is a good, if they are a good surgical candidate in, in, the, in the, you know, setting in which you might've been referred a patient who is a good surgical candidate. Um, but uh, maybe their best option would be surgery rather. I think, I think that definitely builds relationships, at least Absolutely. in my practice, of being able Absolutely. to refer people the other way. Absolutely, 100%. Um, Ari, you just touched on it a little bit. Um, could you talk briefly on the pre-procedure workup? Um, are you doing any of that standalone from urology? So if a patient came off the street and said, you know, hey, I have these symptoms, um, what's your workup? Are you sending them to a urologist? Or are you actually doing like urodynamics and that sort of thing yourself? 
Yeah, so in my practice at UNC, I am relying on my urologist to do all that stuff. And, and, and then again, that goes towards what I was just talking about. Like, this is, that's the kind of collaborative relationship we have. And that's why it works financially for everyone. You know, if a patient comes to me and they have not had a urology workup, then I'm going to refer them to UNC Urology to go have that workup first. And, and I think, that, again, that builds trust, right? We're talking, it just, it, it shows the urologist that you're not just a, a cowboy that's doing your own thing, that, that you're, you know, you believe you have faith in them and, and hopefully, you know, hopefully there needs to be a trusting relationship. Obviously, if you can't trust them and they can't trust you, then that's, that's no good. Um, but I don't do any of my own tests in office. I do know some people that do, and, and you can do that. If you, some people are in a corner, like they can't get any urologist to work with them at all. They, no one wants to you know, work with them. So they are starting to do some of their own tests. It's really easy to get a, um, a Euroflow machine. That's the one that measures the maximum flow uh, there. You know, they cost a few thousand dollars, but you can get one of those easily. Uh, you, you can obviously measure PVR with an ultrasound. That's not, you know, that's not that hard, post flow residual. So uh, you can do things yourself, but I would encourage people as much as possible to collaborate with the urologist. Okay, I think um, we have uh, one more question. Uh, if you're starting a new practice and none of your colleagues are currently performing PAE, how would you learn the variant anatomy as you recommended? Um, sorry, so I zoned for the end. If you're starting your practice and, and your colleagues don't, don't know yeah, the anatomy, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, you kind of went over the anatomy. I, I guess they're basically just asking if you're, you know, kind of a brand new attending, right. um, you know, what would be, the, I guess, the best way to, best way to, to learn, learn anatomy? anatomy. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so there are, I mean, there, I think there are a lot of good resources out there. You know, there are things like, you know, the, the course, the stream course that I talked about where we go through a lot of the anatomy and that. I have a textbook that I, I uh, wrote and edited um, on PAE, which can be, get, you can get through Springer, which has an atlas in the back where I color coded a bunch of different angiograms. Um, and there are, you know, there are other online things, you know, I think you can even, you know, we, if you don't have a lot of PAEs at your center and, but people do UFI at your center, you can look back at UFI angiograms and identify the different branches. Um, it doesn't help with the prostate, of course, but, um, uh, but at least you can identify where the obturator and the internal pedendal and all, and the inferior gluteal mm -hmm. are. Um, so, you know, it's hard. The anatomy is tough. You know, you got to find a good research and it's all about repetition. It's looking at different patients, trying to understand the variants because there are so many of them. Um, and then ultimately you will get comfortable with them after enough repetition. Um, okay, um, all right. Thanks a lot. That was uh, an excellent talk. Uh, good Q&A session as well. Um, to, to the audience, um, Next month, uh, we're doing PE intervention. And then the subsequent month, which will be our last one prior uh, to the summer, will be a uh, case showcase. Um, so we'll, be, we'll have details to follow with that. Uh, and again, uh, Ari, thanks. This was great. Um, really happy you were able to join us this evening. Yeah, glad to be here. All right. See you, everybody.